and nicely brings us to the uh, beginning of this afternoon's session, Identity, uh, Politics and Fundamentalism, which has been chaired by Sohail Ahmed. Would you like to come to the stage with your panel members? Thank you. We have one more. Should we wait for Nada? All right, we're going to get started. Um, we have a, another panelist, so here she is. Um, so as introduced, this is the Identity Politics, Racism, and Fundamentalism plenary session. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce, um, just list out the names of our esteemed panelists. If you want more information, of course, uh, it's in the, their, their bios are in the program and uh, the website as well. Um, we're going to have an opening address from uh, Mariam, Mariame Heli Lucas, who is the um, founder of Secularism is a Women's Issue. Um, we're, we're also joined on the panel uh, by Free Thought Lebanon co-founder Mazen Abu Hamdan. We also have women's rights activist Pragna Patel and Faithless Hijabi founder Zara Kay. And finally, Center for Civil Courage founder Nada Peratovic. So thank you panelists for joining us today and um, let us begin with some opening remarks from Mariama. I would like to introduce this panel by discussing the links which I see between secularism, the different forms of secularism, and identity politics and communalism. The original definition of secularism is from the French Revolution, which is 1789. And it was codified after many, many struggles, only in 1905 in France. Article one of the 1905 law on secularism says that citizens are guaranteed by the secular state total freedom of belief and of practice. Article two, which is the one we are really concerned with, says that the secular state does not recognize any cult, its representatives. It does not interact and dialogue with these representatives of religion. It does not fund them. So you can see for yourself that we are not all under this law of separation between church and state or religions and state. In France, the state only recognizes citizens and not members of communities. Equal citizen, equal before the law. There's a redefinition of this co original concept of secularism which has been promoted by Britain as equal tolerance by the state between all religion, of all religions, which means the state recognizes religions, recognizes its appointed representatives, dialogue with them, negotiate with them, eventually fund them. Just one point, these representatives of religions are not elected, ever. They are self-designated or internally designated. So we are very far from a democratic organization being represented at the level of the state. 
this definition, unfortunately, is the one implicitly adopted by the European Union. I also want to mention that, of course, in the third world, whether in Africa or in Asia, all former colonies of Britain also go by this redefinition of secularism. In other words, if you want to talk, uh, if myself as an Algerian now living in France and uh, convinced that secularism is the separation between state and religions, if I talk secularism with an Indian or a Niger Nigerian, we don't talk about the same thing. So it's very important for us all to reflect on that. I don't consider secular countries like the UK, where the head of state is also the head of the Anglican Church. I don't consider Germany a secular state where lenders collect taxes for religions. I don't consider the USA a secular state with their logo, if you allow me to say so, in God we, we trust, and where you swear in court on the Bible. UK definition of secularism breeds communalism and identity politics. Because religious groups are competing for privileges that the state can grant them. Just one example in the UK, legal privileges of communities, in that case, religious communities. The first one and the most important one in my view is the laws of personal status or family laws, according to which communities can have different laws. There is one law, but it's not for all. You can have unvoted laws decreed by clerics in the name of God, which apply to people who are presumed to belong to this community by virtue of their place of birth or of their names. If you are called Mohammed or Fatima, you are put into this group and you can step out of it legally, but it's just a big effort and a complicated thing to do. And Fragna is the one who knows everything about this. <laughs> In other words, we have different, different groups of citizens which are governed by different laws. How democratic is that? Justice is the other big thing, as you certainly know, about, there, is, there are currently about 30, sorry, 300 <laughs> so-called Sharia courts in Britain, and their judgments are considered valid and transcribed into the legal uh, normal proceedings, unless you fight to step out of it. What I can see as a first consequence is the erosion of citizenship and the abandonment of one law for all. All this, mind you, is done in the name of human rights. In that case, minority rights. The second big consequence of the definition, the redefinition of secularism by Britain is that we are more and more divided the governments like the idea of commu communities and communalism and identity politics because we are more and more divided. I can think, for instance, of the workers' struggles in the 60s in which British workers and migrant workers were fighting together and then later were divided. But if you look at today's struggles, you have different organizations like Muslim workers' organizations and Sikh workers' organizations and Hindu workers' organizations, etc. How can we, for one minute, believe that this does not weaken the struggles? 
And this fragmentation of the people into smaller and smaller entities apply also to human rights more and more. At the UN, I'm sure you know that, uh, there is, I mean, the Muslim fundamentalist organizations have, I don't find the word, sorry, English is not my first language, as you can sure tell. Uh, there's this charter of Islamic human rights, which has been deposited, can I say that? Deposited? Hmm? Not adopted, definitely not. It's unofficial, but it's there. And although officially the UN doesn't make any reference to it, they mention it you know, over and over again, so we don't know when this will become part of uh, what they consider in, in their decisions. Again, all this is done in the name of human rights, minority rights. So that's what I wanted to say as an introduction. Thank you, Mariani. And I'm going to start the first question um, with you to kind of follow up on a couple of these concepts which I've heard you say. Um, so in your estimation, what are the relevant distinctions between citizenship, communalism, and secularism? And related, what trends do you see with the adoption of communalized laws uh, versus a single universal law for, for everyone? Looking at it from the point of view of women, for instance, I can see very clearly that women's rights come last after religious rights, minority rights, etc. Which means that there is a conflict in you know, human rights organizations. By the way, I can't resist telling you that I have not yet seen one single international human rights organization taking a public stand for Rushdie. Okay. Um, in the name of human rights, in the name of promoting the rights of minorities in the West, we promote cultural relativism. In other words, what is good for Westerners may not be good for us, third world people. And I think this is a big, huge problem. Giving, I mean, secular laws give rights to people. They don't force people to renounce their religious duties if they feel like it. Two examples. If the law of a country allows for reproductive rights, contraception and abortion, Catholic, Roman Catholic women are not forced to use contraception and abortion. If the law of a country allows for equal inheritance, a devout Muslim woman who believes her duty is to give half of her share to her brother can still do it. So the problem is not that it erases the rights of minorities and of what they think are their religious duties. What fundamentalists want is that it would be forbidden to, with, to everybody or what fundamentalist Catholics want is that contraception will be forbidden for everybody. Thank you, Mariama. So uh, I'm gonna bring Pragna in now. Um, a related question would be, what does um, citizenship mean to you? And how do you see it in relation to the rise of identity politics? Well, first of all, as Mariama said, citizenship rights to me essentially involves a democratic social contract, a democratic contract between citizens and the state, in which the state guarantees certain rights, the right to life, the right to work, the right to education, the right to access um, health facilities, and so on. 
Um, and, you know, the, the, these are really, really important rights. Uh, the whole concept of citizenship rights, I have to say, is now under attack, not just by fundamentalisms of all kinds, religious fundamentalisms, but also by authoritarian states globally. Um, and we have seen in the British context the way in which citizenship rights are now being stripped. One cannot lose one's citizenship rights in law, in international law. But we're beginning to see that in the wake of the rise of religious fundamentalism and the war on terror and the way in which, you know, young people were radicalized and went off to fight for ISIS and so on. And some of them were very young girls or young children, in fact. And what they do, we do not condone. But the fact that the British state can say that they no longer have citizenship rights is alarming and disturbing. I would argue that those people need to be brought back and held to account through criminal process, right? Due process, these are parts of democratic processes that we should be upholding. So we have to be very concerned that in this moment in time, these are not guaranteed rights and they can be taken away. In relation to identity politics, I mean, this is a big debate, but I want to start off by saying identity politics hasn't always been regressive. When I started out my political life in Britain in the 70s, late 70s and 80s, we, I am Asian, South Asian background, but I adopted, like many South Asians, the term black. And we talked about our struggles against racism as black struggles. And in fact, we borrowed from the American civil rights movement you know, where the idea of being black was turned on its head and instead of being seen to be derogatory was something to be proud of. We adopted the term black and South Asians and minorities from other backgrounds, African Caribbeans, Middle Eastern, all of us came together and we invested the term which we saw as secular with progressive political values. And we saw it as part of the wider left struggle to challenge racism, whether it be institutional, um, through laws that discriminated and held minorities to be second-class citizens, immigration nationality laws, or whether it was police brutality on the streets or racial attacks by far-right groups. These were all things we fought in the name of the black struggle. It was a secular, mobilization, but we also saw it as connected to wider progressive left social justice politics. So we supported, <laughs> we supported those in Northern Ireland who were challenging British colonial rule. We supported Palestinian struggles. We supported independence struggles globally. We supported the miners' struggle in 1984, which Thatcher was destroying the, you know, the, the working class, the communities. We saw the connections. It wasn't easy to challenge racism in a working class community whom we had expressed solidarity, but which could also be racist, or to challenge socialists when they kept saying the struggle is the class struggle women can get their rights later you know these were all difficult difficult things to navigate but that identity that black identity that we invested you know with such hopefully progressive values was decimated post rushdi post Rushdi, we had a situation where our identities were no longer black. We were not even ethnic. So we weren't, the state didn't say, okay, you are now Indian or Pakistani or Bangladeshi. We were fragmented along religious lines. So, so Pragna, why do you think that 
change happened? I think that it changed because the left failed to deal with the question of solidarity and connection between the struggles that we wage. There's that problem. The second problem is that it suited the state. It really suited the state. And here I want to bring in another dimension, which is the dimension of neoconservatism, neoliberalism, and um, the way in which the state started to decimate the idea of a welfare state. When you destroy services that should be there for all citizens, you create a vacuum. Who fills the vacuum? Who has the resources, the networks, the ability to create, to fill that vacuum because the state is retreating? You know, little government, we don't want big government anymore. We don't want the idea of ensuring that every citizen is looked after from cradle to grave. We're retreating because we're privatizing, there's austerity, and plus we think communities can do it better. Religion fills the gap. And religion is dominated by fundamentalists. They shout the loudest, they have the seat at the public table. So they are the ones who determine what our community needs. They are the ones who are also working with the state to communalize identities along religious lines. And post Rushdi, Muslims were saying, we are Muslims and we want our, um, we want our demands met. And what were those demands? They were nothing to do with fighting racism, nothing to do with fighting poverty and inequality, and everything to do with privileging their religion. Right. And once they started, other religions followed. So every single community that was divided along faith lines had its leaderships that became the gatekeepers of the communities, and all of them were demanding one thing only, in the name of human rights, in the name of anti-racism, in the name of multiculturalism, but what they were demanding was the right to protect their religion from criticism right. and the right to do to their women what they wanted. Thank you, Pragna. I, I want to switch to um, stepping back a bit and thinking about um, the, the framing. Um, and so, Mazan, I want to bring you in on this. Um, what are the characteristics of a politics of liberation, if not identity-based. Thank you, Sohail. Um, so I would like to begin by telling you some more about the context of our country, Lebanon, which is uh, quite different from what you're facing in, in Europe and other Western countries. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin with a, with, a, with a question for the audience. Every country uh, conducts uh, a census on a regular basis, accounting of the population. Uh, can you take a guess when was the last time we had one in Lebanon? <laughs> Let me just say. Now, the actual answer is 1932. 1932 was the last time we counted the population in Lebanon. And since then, we have stopped counting because it creates troubles. So, the whole country is uh, compromised of different religious groups. 18 official groups to be uh, specific and these groups are not really getting along so well we have uh, civil wars or many civil wars every few decades and the whole way the country is, is is built is based on the idea of quota and power sharing so we have uh, the president must be the christian the prime minister must be sunni and and, and so on and so on uh, what this has produced is bickering and division and competition and lack of accountability so Assuming we have a minister of finance who is corrupt, but he is ha he happens to represent the Shia in government. If you want to hold that person accountable, it suddenly becomes twisted that you're attacking that community. And religious sensitivities would rise and eventually that person would never be held accountable. And this is the way uh, we have been doing things in, in Lebanon for, for many, many years. Uh, even more than that, every time we want to hire public employees, let's say fire rangers, uh, it has to be based on religious quota. And if the quota is not met, then no one is hired. And we've had this actually three years ago where there was a vacuum, there was not enough fire rangers, and we've had fires, and we have had forests burned down because of the quota issue. So in a way, I, I come from a country which is deeply divided and dysfunctional because of this, this bickering 
uh, sectarian identities. So then we come into, into the scene as, as secular activists, as, as atheists, uh, as democracy activists, and we quickly learned that uh, we cannot simply emphasize our identity in the face of everyone else's identity, because in a way it emphasizes these divisions and it, it strengthens these walls. Uh, so what we've been doing is that we have decided to be wiser and now we speak of common values. So to answer your question, we think the way forward for political liberation is not identity, but rather common values which we can rally people around, even from other uh, communal groups. I think that's a key point. Um, common values <laughs> over identities. Thank you, Muslim. Um, so I'm going to bring in Zara now and um, ask, what effect does identity politics have on dissent? And related, how do we confront fundamentalism without um, risking, um, or without feeding into racism? Hi, guys. It's nice to see you guys from up here. It's a height that I wouldn't get. <laughs> I think over the past day, yesterday and today we've had so many different panels and a lot of people touched on identity and politics in their own panels and it's just a combination of everything that i've had heard from different people and i think in my opinion identity is formed by non-dominant groups created by one because dominant groups are taken advantage or are assumed that you know are privileged and when we kind of relate this to racism, for instance, or the BLM movement, where it was just down to all white people are privileged, they're all racists, and that in parallel created a society and a group of people that had a backlash and started talking about white supremacy because they had been ignored for so long. Similarly with Islam, when we see all groups of people who are Muslim, of a Muslim background, are considered to be one. And that when there is anything bad about it, all Muslims are criticized, or all Muslims from the far right are being taken down by groups. And at the same time, if there are Muslim minority groups who oppose things or who talk about liberation, they're so easily shut down. And that's their form of dissent that is so easily shut down and unrecognized, and that kind of transposes over ex-Muslims. When we talk about these things, it is so unheard of that a person or a woman from a Muslim background can talk about liberal views, which is not her culture. It is not her, it's, it's not part of what she has been taught as a, coming from her community. And, you know, very quickly, so many parts of the left that Pragna touched on is, you know, we're, we're shut down, we're not, we're not given that attention, our struggles are not shared, the left has taken our platforms away, and when we talk about it, so many people who sympathize with Muslims, as we all do, because we have Muslims family, Muslim family, start assuming that we're being anti-Muslim bigots, and that they don't take our word for what it is and start correlating us with white supremacists, or say that we are the ones who are trying to encourage white supremacists and taking the blame away from the actual bigots and putting it on us when we're simply talking for our rights to dissent, to speak about it. So Zara, how do you combat that um, when we as ex-Muslims are speaking out and you get charges of um, racism or being anti-Muslim? How, how do you yourself uh, handle that? I stick to my story. I mean, there have been times where I've had to go on the platform and say, I'm not against people's beliefs. I'm not against, sorry, I'm not against people believing. I am against some of their beliefs. And I have to continuously talk about, I'm not an anti-Muslim bigot, I have Muslim family, and continuously spread that message. But at the same time, it's still taking away the platform that I want to talk about ex-Muslims. So I, I feel like we continuously, like our words have power to some people and may invoke, depending on what we say in you know, the first panel on blasphemy and free speech, where, where is that line? And I think it's recognizing that line that is very important, especially when you have a platform, right. but keeping true to yourself. 
I often wonder, though, can we ever get past the need to be throat clearing every time we speak? I don't think so. Everyone's going to be offended over something and they'll start labeling for anything else. I think you just, I think you need to keep going. The slurs that you get for being Islamophobic, I will accept that slur, even if I try correcting them what Islamophobia is. I'll just go like, fine, I am Islamophobic, because I do fear Islam. It wants the death of me. Why should I not criticize it? Thank you, Zara. Um, I'm gonna bring in Nada now, and um, We've talked a lot about uh, these rights in general and identities, but I want to bring the focus to women's rights. So, Nada, what are the implications on women's rights in all of this? Uh, we, are, we were talking about different identity groups, and we have to be aware that in all these different identity groups, we have one part of the group that is the same, the women. So what we need also to t uh, notice that uh, these, that women are either divided by these groups, so they don't uh, see other women like their sisters or that they have the same fate of, of oppression. And this is what we have to uh, take uh, to consider, and I think that it, it, it would be best considered to the feminist critics, so to, that every woman has her, can be in one identity group if she wants, but she has to know that all we, we share the same uh, oppression by our, or by, by our uh, sex-based rights, or I say it, it it is means of reproduction that we have and that we share something that is, it is beyond the identity groups, that we as a w women are a class and that we should be solidar with every other women. That Thank you, Nada. So what I'm hearing there, and, and let me know if you agree, is that in, in some sense it's not um, an identity like any other. It's almost a a category error to 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 label it just that because it's so much more and like you said it's it's a whole different classification or yes. different class of uh, like of workers rights. like uh, Mariam mentioned or Pragna mentioned worker workers class this is women's class we have this because we have uh, our bodies are for not determined for the uh, 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 reproduction but we have this ability and based on this all the, these years or, or uh, millennia, we are, we are oppressed, exploited by this and discriminated. So we have to really have this awareness. Also in the atheist and humanist community, I'm always uh, emphasizing that we have really to, to uh, take these feminist critics and to work on better, uh, to help women's rights ri rise, especially in these now uh, situations everywhere, global. Thank you, Nada. Um, I'm gonna take it back quickly to Pragna. Um, how can we separate universal rights from identity politics? How do we solve this? I think we have to keep asserting the fact that universal rights are for everyone and that universal rights have been fought by everyone globally. One of the things of uh, that I face and I know many colleagues have faced when we challenge where, uh, particularly women's rights within minorities, when we, ch when we fight for women's rights within minorities working in a larger majoritarian country where we're constantly also mindful of the racist backlash, uh, we are often, and, and also the community backlash, we're often told that you're a traitor to your community, you're a traitor to your identity, you're betraying the cultural and religious fabric of your family and society, and that these are Western values. That, you know, women's rights are Western. Feminism is a Western concept. And we, in minority 
you know, communities have to constantly remind, whether it's the racists and the far right who also say our British values are democracy and human rights as if we don't also subscribe to those as minorities. So we constantly have to say, whether it's to our own community leaderships and fundamentalists, or whether it's to the far right or the British state or others who seem to think that somehow, you know, British values or Western values are different, we have to remind them that when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written, it was written by people from all over the world. And people borrowed from their own traditions, their own liberal traditions, their own moral codes to contribute to what is now the human rights framework, which is still evolving as we discover and unearth injustices. So I, I have to constantly talk about the need for common values, the need for you to subscribe to human rights values, and to point out when people use human rights selectively. Fundamentalists are very good at using human rights selectively. I want my right not to be tortured, but I will torture all the women, right? And what's more, I will prevent the women from invoking their right to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or CEDAW or any other you know, women's rights framework because my culture tells me that, you know, women, those are Western things. So we have to challenge that selectivity in the way in which human rights are invoked and to challenge the cultural relativism that goes with that constantly. And these are major struggles that are taking place. And I think it was Karima Benoun who said that the struggle to keep sec uh, the church and state separate and to keep religion and the law separate is one of the most urgent struggles taking place in the world today, as people have said around us. I think that's really, really important to acknowledge. And the, and the second thing is we have to keep challenging racism too. We really have to, the rise of the far right, the rise of authoritarian forces, the rise of authoritarian states is as much a danger to us as the religious right. And we have seen whether it's Poland or Hungary or Brazil or India, and racism is not just a product of the, the, the West. We see racism in our own countries of origin. We, all these countries have moved towards authoritarianism and we are seeing that at the local level, at the national level, and at the international level, a retreat from democratic human rights principles. So the one thing we can do, the only way I think we can forge solidarity is to mobilize around the human rights framework. You know, in, in the UK, the British government is talking about revoking the Human Rights Act and pulling out of the European Convention on Human Rights. This is problematic. Yeah. It's problematic because fundamentalists are also asking for the same thing. Right. So we are in a very dangerous moment, I think, politically. And the sooner we can come together around common values and thrash out what those common values of decency, empathy, compassion, the right to our own autonomy, the, more, the better because we are losing against the far right and the religious right. They are gaining ground. Thank you, Pragna. I think Nada wanted to say something. And then we'll go to Mariana. About cultural relativism, there is one uh, sentence in Germany, very famous, like when Hans beats his wife, it is domestic violence. And when Muhammad does it, then it is the tradition. You know, that's, and I want also to, to, to remember that 50 years ago in Europe, domestic violence was also not a theme, not a topic. It was like, it is private. Whatever happens in the, <laughs> behind the walls, it, it is private, it is their marriage, it is, a, and then it started not to be, not to be any more private, but political and feminist thought that it, uh, 
yes, fought that it uh, became a political topic that violence is uh, violence. It happens in Germany or it happens, I don't know, Saudi Arabia. So this is what she said. These are really the common values. We want a life without violence, without exploitation, without discrimination. Every human being, especially women, have the right to 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 reach for it. So this is, and one another question, another uh, about secularism. This is also something interesting, and I will talk about it maybe later when I'm talking about Croatia. Secularism is really a guarantee for all of us, not only us non-believers, atheists, and so for the separation of, of, of state and church, but also for the believers, and that they don't think about it. They think always that secularism is something that um, is taking their religion away. But I say to my Catholic friends in, in, in Croatia, uh, you, have, you have the right, as you said, to, to believe and you have the right to, 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 to worship your God and everything. But also secularism and gives you the right also, for example, to uh, go to artificial insemination if you want, to have an abortion if you want. So uh, when I tell them, do you want a theocracy maybe, they, they say no. <laughs> so please, secularism really a guarantee of freedom of, for all of us. This right, is for very the religious and the non-religious. Yeah. Very important okay. to, to know this. Thank you, Nata. Let's bring it over to Mariame. You, you want no? Okay. Okay, so then I'll go to my um, next question. Um, so... Mariame, this is this goes back to fundamentalism. Um, I've heard you talk about fundamentalism as an international project, and then also secularism as an international project. Uh, maybe you can expand on that a bit um, and contrast the two. Well, if we look at Muslim fundamentalism, which is only one of them, it's very obvious that it's an international project in the sense that we can see at least violence committed by Muslim fundamentalists absolutely on all continents. And the idea is to make their presence visible and to force the local communities to abide by their rules. So it's really much beyond one country. If I think, for instance, of the Hindu right, well, they, of course, have a foot in Britain or in North America, but basically it's not spreading throughout Asia, it's limited to India. Well, Muslim fundamentalism is an expansionist political movement. And I insist that it's a political movement which has implications for how we are going to fight it. We cannot fight it in one country alone. And all, the other thing which strikes me about fundamentalism is that at the moment in history, we see all sorts of extreme right religious movements rising, whether it's the, the Christian right in the US at the moment, with, which are limiting reproductive rights, all, you know, all sorts of countries, Brazil, etc. Um, why is it a political movement? Because I don't believe personally that Muslim fundamentalism is a religious movement. In my experience of a few decades, let's say, they are totally ignorant in matters of religion. Each time we try to confront them, with the help of progressive religious thinkers, they show their ignorance. I, as an atheist, know a lot more about Islam than they do. Basically, that's what I could see throughout my own experience. So I consider them a polit political movement as of the far right. And if you, if you allow me to make comparisons which are slightly provocative, I would like to compare them 
them with the Nazis and the fascists. No, I'm not using these words lightly because I don't think you can compare events taking place in such different circumstances and in, in, with such a time gap. But having said that, the Nazi considered they were the superior race, the Aryan race. And the Muslim fundamentalists consider they are the superior creed. And in the name of their superiority, they think they have the right and the duty to eliminate, physically eliminate, those who they see as infrahumans, untermans, which, strange enough, covers basically the same categories as the fascist and Nazis did, communists, Jews, minorities, ethnic minorities, unbelievers in our case, which is added to the fascist and Nazi list, but it proceeds from the same logic. They justify their superiority by reference to a historical past, which they mythified. For instance, fascists were talking about the glorious past of Rome, but the Muslim fundamentalists are talking about the golden age of Islam. I'm not saying it didn't exist. I'm saying that they changed the meaning of these historical facts in order to justify their domination today. So, Maria, what about... Just, uh, to let, let, let me finish on this, please. Like the fascists and Nazis, they are pro-capitalist. And I know the left has illusions about this, that they would be against capitalism. They are not. <laughs> and like the fascists, and especially like the Nazis, if you remember the Nazi slogan of the, on the place of women, in the church, in the kitchen, and at the cradle. That's something Muslim fundamentalists completely agree with. Right. So we are now in a moment in history in which we see the rise of far right movements, some of them, not all, being religiously justified. But if we only look at religion, I think we miss the point. They are extreme right, extremely dangerous, and provide propagating their views very quickly around the world, not just in our countries. And with the duplicity of states and of human rights, international human rights organizations. So, Mariame, do you see secularism as an international project, as a, a, a legitimate or workable counter? That's my wish that it will become an international movement. And I think that's what we should be doing, not just by having contacts with people in various parts of the world, but in working towards, and it's not for tomorrow, but working towards an international of secularists around the world. So it's a pious wish. <laughs> Thank you, Mariamme. Um, <laughs> staying on that topic of fundamentalism, uh, I want to bring Nada back in, um, as she's familiar with uh, the scene in, in Croatia, where there's a neoconservative religious anti-abortion movement. Um, and Nada, I wanted to know how um, how is fundamentalism there impacting women's rights? Okay. So, uh, first I have to explain that uh, abortion is legal in Croatia. Uh, but for the last 30 years, by the support of the Catholic Church, there is a mini minority of neoconservative a movement and conservative movement, they are still minority, but they are allowed, they have the financial support, support also from the Catholic Church, support from the 
far right from America or the oligarchy uh, system from Russia. And what they uh, succeeded in is in these 30 years, they changed the narrative, they changed the mind of the people. So now abortion is stigmatized in the society in Croatia. Um, okay, they, they held their marches for life. Uh, they uh, have also websites on which they explain that abortion will uh, have, you will have a post-abortive syndrome, you will be uh, traumatized by, by, you will never be the same after an abortion and everything. And of course you are killing uh, the fetus and also they also organize uh, prayers in front of hospitals. We have, don't have abortion clinics. We have hospitals in which we, they, they, uh, that provide abortions. And of course, there is this uh, rise of the Catholic religion and, and belief in the, in the, uh, among the people. And many women are afraid to say they want an abortion. They are afraid to say it to their families uh, or do the friends, and they are afraid to go to the hospital. So in these uh, surroundings, we, uh, the Humanist and Feminist Organization Center for Civil Courage decided two years ago to organize a women's abortion network. We have now 50. We, the abortion network is called Brave Sisters, and uh, we have 50 educated women across Croatia. Anna, in the first row, is one part of these brave sisters. Um, and what we, what we are giving to women who contact us, what we are providing them, we provide information, first of all, basic information about where to go, to which hospital, where you can have an abortion, which kind of an abortion. Uh, we provide really detail, detailed information. So like, okay, if you go there, uh, the first person you will see, or the nurse can be maybe a little bit insidious or can say something humiliate, humiliating, but we are here to support you. And of course we support women if they need accommodation in a bigger city, if they're coming from, from another city, if they need, uh, if they need, we morally and per, uh, psychologically support them. We say to them, you are not doing a sin. You don't have to have guilt for the rest of your life. You have the right to, to go to abortion. You have the right on bodily autonomy, on having uh, the right to choose for your life or for your future. Even if you have already children, also mothers come to us and say, I have two, two children, I don't want any more. I can't bear it, I can't, uh, I can't mentally uh, rise. I mean, everybody who has children knows what it means. It's not only to, to give birth, it is you have to rise it for 20 years to, 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 to take care of, of them. So what we succeeded in this now, less than two years, we helped 150 women already, and also financially, also women from, from students till, 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 till mothers. Uh, and what we did also even if we, and what I didn't mention, I'm sorry, the biggest obstacle, and why we are doing this, the biggest obstacle in Croatia, and this is about the fundamentalism, what we are coming to, the biggest obstacle in Croatia is that 59% of gynecologists in public hospitals refuse to perform an abortion on religious grounds. So we have uh, some Hospitals in the biggest, bigger city, like in Split, this is the biggest city on the coast, where like 45 gynecologists are in the hospital and 40 don't perform abortion, only five perform it. 
And uh, of course, if the woman comes to an ultrasound, there are some, she can uh, face humiliation. They can say, why you are doing this? Or some, for example, some uh, a gynecologist says, oh, today is, uh, is a religious holiday. Don't, don't do the, the decision now. Don't choose now. Come another day. You know, or, or see, see the ultrasound picture, see that the, the heart is beating already. Are you sure? I mean, nobody asks a woman who wants to have a, a pregnancy or who wants to keep the pregnancy, who wants to have a baby, are you sure? But every time they ask a woman, are you sure you want to end a pregnancy? Right. And this is... Thank you, Nada. Um, uh, I've been just one, I, only one, also one case I want to say. For example, we had this case in March. A woman went to a, a, a clinic. She had an abortion, a surgical abortion. She thought she had it. Three weeks later, she is going to her gynecologist. And the, the oncologist, she's saying, uh, you are still pregnant and the fetus is intact. I mean, and she was like, what is happening here? And she went to the, to, the, to the clinic again and she said, you didn't do it right. I don't know what. And they say, uh, they lied to her and they s said to her, okay, but now it is too late because you have only up to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So like, sorry, but you will we are, uh, congrats, you will have the, the right. child. So supposedly it's legal, but there's all these obstacles in the way at a practical level. Um, and I want only to say that we, what we did, the woman um, contacted us, she was devastated, she was crying, she didn't know what to do. It's not the only case from this hospital. We had also a girl who was a victim of, of trafficking, and the perpetrator, the rapist, she was pregnant by the ra rapist, and they also lied to her when she has the right to, 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 to make an abortion. Right. Both cases, we said, we, we brought them to Netherlands, and they had their abortions. Thank you, Nada. So we're gonna, we've only got, I think, about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, there was a few more questions I wanted to ask the panel. Um, but I think we'll switch to audience questions to make sure all of you get um, a voice here. So we have a lady at the back there. Hello, I have a question to Pragna. Uh, when it comes to, um, whenever we're talking about the fundamentalists in power, and they're usually in politics in the government, but there's like something specific that we need to know as well, that there's people that, and, and I emphasize this word, it's like they like to belong somewhere, like they like to belong to the group, which we all do now, we belong to this group. And there are people that belong to Christianity or Muslim, but how can we secure that? Like after 100 years, we're not gonna be having this loop again I think the, one of the problems about uh, we all need to start off belonging to a group in order to understand, raise our own consciousness and understand our own circumstances and our own oppression. So whether it's women or black minority people or workers or, you know, we start somewhere. The problem with identity politics, and we haven't really touched on this, is the issue of dissenting and, and identity politics. Because what we've seen, and I've seen it not just in relation to religious fundamentalism, but also conservatives and traditionalists in our communities, in order for us as women to come together to articulate our needs, we had to be in the business of dissenting. Right? We had to dissent against the patriarchal, religious, cultural structures of our society, our families, our communities that subjugate women, that tell women that their place is in the kitchen, not in the public. So, you know, dissent is vital, I would say, 
to any kind of even progressive group identity. The problem we have is even when we're trying to articulate our own situation, others are shutting us down, right? So in the context of fighting for women's rights, at an individual level, the family is shutting you down. Then the wider community is trying to shut you down and the religious leaders are trying to shut you down. And then the religious leaders are working with the state to all shut you down, right, through their policies and their decisions of who are authentic leaders and who represents the authentic identity of minorities. So you have this, you know, dissenting is vital. So whether we are within our communities forming our own feminist consciousness but fighting against the conservatives and traditionalists, or whether we're in the left, on the left, and we have to challenge those who say women's issues, wait. Race issues, wait, right? Homosexual, sexual minority issues, wait. That's the kind of response we've had. And I have to say, it's the failure of the left that's also laid the foundation for the rise of religious fundamentalism. Because if the left had dealt with Rushdie in the British context, we wouldn't have seen what we see now which is complete state appeasement of religious demands, gender segregation in public spaces, gender segregated schools that deny minority girls the right to sex education, the right to mix with boys, the right to go on residential trips, the right to um, you know, be exposed to science. These are all things that are happening. Um, you know, we have the rise of Sharia. I mean, it's not completely embedded in the legal structures, but there are parallel legal systems, quasi-legal systems forming. And what happens is, is not that the state is saying to minority women, you have your own religion and culture. It's the peer pressure, it's the community pressure that says to minority women, you do not need to access the secular laws of this country you have to access the religious laws. And the same social compulsion, you know, that's used to prevent them from then getting a divorce, separating, having their own lives, having the right to inheritance, as Maria May talked about, and so on and so forth. So we, democracy, dissent, I think, the principle of dissent is vital both in forming groups but is also challenging the power structures within those groups. Thanks, Pragna. Um, Jimmy, we had a question here. No? You want to go ahead? You can get a mic in the front row. Hi. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear you talking about, uh, you know, these women's rights and women as a class, uh, and all of the rights that you seem to be talking about are women's sex-based rights. And I'm puzzled because in the UK, the left-leaning parties and the Labour government, when they're being asked, you know, what is the definition of a woman, they're saying they can't define what a woman is because it would be transphobic to do so. We have examples of teenage girls in gender-neutral toilets at school not um, going to the toilet during the school day or waiting until lunchtime so they can go to Sainsbury's and use the women's toilets because they feel really embarrassed because boys are in there shaming them when they're on their period or mocking them when they're going to do a wee. So I really agree that you know, these, the rights that you're talking about, they're sex-based rights, we need to fight for them, they're really important. But how do we do that when we can't even define what a woman is on the left? Conversely, what we're finding is that parties on the right have absolutely no inhibitions defining uh, what a woman is and using uh, a biological basis to do so. So there feels like a betrayal there around women's sex-based rights, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on it. <laughs> my thoughts are the same as yours. We feel we are all uh, left oriented and we feel as women also in Croatia, I have to tell you, we have the same uh, discussion and we are also silenced. I am a persona non grata in some feminist <laughs> circles because I am for the women's sex-based sex women's rights. 
and uh, and now I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> just a mo just a moment. Um, uh, yes, we we uh, what uh, I have to say. The left betrayed us, women, and this is this is yes. This is this hurts me more than I don't know. And what is what I think is more dangerous? The far right is taking these critics, but they are not taking it in favor of our women. They are taking it for their own ideology, you know? And this is a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Men, but many women now I see on Facebook, they, they uh, sometimes uh, reshare some of the uh, far-right activists who say what a woman it is, adult hum uh, human being, this is this. And I say to them, don't reshare uh, 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 quotes from far-right activists because they will never be our allies. Never, they will be nowhere else. We have, we have our, we have to to really women or feminists have to be together and to say where where we can make a compromise. I mean, uh, we are aware of of people that had have gender dysphoria or. Uh, transgender people, of course, we don't deny their existence. And this is also identity-based, again. The problem is, if you, if you criticize their statements or views, they will say you criticize their identity. And you are transphobic, of course. Today is everything transphobic. Biology is transphobic and so on. So this is the problem. When we talk about identity, we should talk about statements or about um, uh, yes, statements and 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 arguments. I, of course, I I I will um, I will be ally for transgender people. This is no question. I was also always for LGBT people. 10 years ago, everybody for us. But why, why they don't, and this is also something interesting, they have a slur for women. Although the men are violence against them, are uh, torturing them, are killing them everywhere. And they have no slur for men. And, but they have a slur for women who are, were always there while uh, 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 allies. I mean, I have to uh, also to tell uh, to what what are the lesbians facing today? The lesbians, when I uh, I didn't know this, but I read it, about it. The lesbians were the the, the 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 persons who in the 80s when the the AIDS came in were the, the only uh, 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 persons who, who were helping gay men and who were uh, going to the hospitals and, and supporting them. And now where are the gay men? Why are they, they don't support the, the lesbians? Did you, did you want to come yeah, in I on that same question? Really briefly, because then we will I, I to just another. wanted to add, I totally agree with everything you said. I mean, I think that we're in a period where the idea of censorship, the culture of censorship, the culture of cancelling, the culture has seeped into other social justice movements too. So it's not just a question of, you know, the struggle against religious fundamentalism. The problem I have, and I don't think trans rights and women's rights should be competing in this way. The problem I have with some of the transgender Ideo ideological positions is that I think this is the first time in history and I'm uh, willing to be corrected where a social justice movement has been based on the erasure of another powerless group in this case women right I cannot think of another, when, when, when you know, blacks were fighting for liberation in the US, it wasn't based on let's decimate the workers or let's decimate women. Women's rights have not been fought on the basis of let's decimate minorities. So why is it that we have what I consider to be quite regressive ideological movement that its very premise is based on 
let's get rid of the idea, the material reality of sex. So we are in this strange position where we're all in the realms of subjective feelings and, you know, and this whole culture of censorship that's infected all these social justice movements. So feminism itself is divided. Every, you know, everywhere we are fragmented and, and we're not able to come together because we're so busy defining our difference from each other and working out who can claim the highest victimhood <laughs> instead of what is common to us, our humanity, and how can we struggle against racism, xenophobia, religious fundamentalism, patriarchy, um, you know, sort of, prejudice towards gays and lesbians and trans people too and everybody else how do we come together we have lost our ability to work out what how we forge unity and how we forge solidarity thanks brad now uh, i think we have uh, are we are we done for time we got five minutes i think uh, five minutes five. so um we'll go to um we've got a question uh here um lady in uh, i think orange And I'll ask the panelists, because we're down to the last few minutes, if you can try to condense it down to maybe 30 seconds and we can uh, try to process Hi, uh, the other this questions. question can be a bit repetitive. I don't know if anybody asked, but uh, I'm in academia. And in academia now, there is this uh, sh like shadow of fear to speak about anything. Like if I want my funding to continue, if I want my job, if I want to make sure that I have a scientific career going on for next the rest of my life, then I simply should not speak what you are speaking about. Because I may get cancelled by the very left you are talking about. The very left leaning even I am, and I want to be because I believe in human rights, uh, women's rights, and trans rights. Uh, but it's becoming very difficult because as soon as I open my mouth, for example, about political Islam, uh, as an ex-Muslim, and immediately there are these uh, very uncomfortable uh, verbal attacks from some of my left-leaning friends who, for example, try to tell me that I understood Islam wrong, and my experiences are basically experiences because I was accidentally born in a very strict, uh, maybe not so nice uh, family in Bangladesh, so it is just my personal, because they have very nice Muslim friends, and I try to tell them, and I understand they have nice Muslim friends, I have nice Muslim friends, I grew up with them. It is not about them, it is about the religion and what I experienced uh, living in a Muslim majority country where Sharia is implied more. Right. Now, my question is that as academicians, uh, well, academy was a place basically where most of these enlightenment thoughts came from. But now I feel we are moving towards a future, even at present. Uh, if you're an academician and you want funding, you want recognition, you are simply silenced. You should not talk about it or else you don't have funding. So what are your comments about it? How some of us academicians who are ex-Muslims activists can still keep our job or funding and keep doing what we, are, we would love to do? Thank you. So I think we should bring Zar in for this uh, if you want to you comment on that. Yeah, I can totally relate. I work in engineering and I was told I'm being unnecessarily provocative by just stating uh, that I'm an ex-Muslim, despite using separate names, my legal name and my online name. And to which I asked, is it unnecessarily provocative to fight for women's rights when my very existence is blasphemous and what you care about people's hurt feelings and your branding, not about my life and the women suffering because of it? Which is really interesting because the left's was historically standing for liberation. But when it came to our liberation, you know, they've turned a blind eye. It's not our culture. We're not going to talk about it. You know, it's their, it's, it's, it's their culture. No, Jessica, it's not about culture. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve those human rights, the same liberal rights that you have. I want them and people like me too. 
running an organization, looking for support for ex-Muslims, not having the funding to support mental health. And in Sweden, by definition, I'm considered to be right-wing because I speak of dissent. That very definition, and I stand for all liberal values, but when it comes to us, you know, don't talk about Islam, we don't want to offend the Muslims, but they do not recognize that Islam by its definition is far right. The thing that you oppose, you're supporting. All right, I think that's all the time that we have, and I want to keep the, the schedule uh, on schedule. Uh, so I want to thank all the panelists here uh, for this uh, very informative session. Brilliant, thank you. Brilliant, Palin, and, and thank you, Suhail. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.